Search the name Tengiz Abaladze and you'll largely be met with articles, short mostly, which introduce his 1984 film Repentance. They'll describe it as being anti-Stalinist, as being a film which throws down tyrants, hangs them from lampposts. His biography is obscured. We're talking about a Georgian VGIK graduate, like all your faves. Repentance, actually released in 1987, would be his last film. Before that, notably, was The Wishing Tree from 1977 and The Plea from 1967. Together they formed a trilogy. Twelve films in total. He died in 1994. Folklore, national myth, generational guilt and attention held within and between communities and families, stark heavy landscapes, fields of flowers, playfulness, emotive faces and heads and hands, portraiture, as we'd expect from a compatriot of Parajanov. No doubt, Abeladze made films that were political or sociological, sure. But today, me and Ralph are going to do, are going to talk about them in a classic MoobTube style, ignoring the IMDB, BFI-esque blurbs, political slants, digging into their formalism, their poetics, their feeling. I'm personally a big fan. Ralph, you I'm not so sure about. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, The Wishing Tree is a very beautiful film. Mm. It's very stunning. Um, and it's, a, f- it's a film that's full of poetry. It's a film that draws upon, I guess, various tra- folk traditions and... Um, uh, and sort of it's a bit like how people talk about Prajnov you know they sort of say oh it's yeah. it's, it's like if you know someone in the 12th century had a camera um, yeah like a, a reenactment almost yeah because it's a filmmaking style mm. that seems to be well not exactly like a reenactment but it, it just is a filming, filmic style that seems to doesn't it obviously does have the cinematic conventions you know created mm. by the forefathers of cinema you know Eisenstein Hitchcock etc but um but there are aspects to it that are quite unconventional and don't necessarily seem avant-garde they seem to just be no. quite intuitive um, there are, there are there are moments of him which you're right it's, there are moments of him where it always has a televisual style to it um you know the, shot these reverse kind shot. of shot reverse shot these kind of uh, kind of these these messy zooms and kind of sloppy zooms that might chase a figure across the landscape, pulling in and pulling out. Um, at times, he'll slip into this kind of more conventional avant-garde, you know, framing. You know, the camera angled up the body or something. Other times, it's kind of it does feel like a much looser, um, scrappier way of making film, which does put you in the thick of things you know one thing you say about Parajanov is you know Parajanov was the master of composed tableau right he mm. was the ca- Parajanov's camera very rarely moved um uh mostly in shadows of forgotten ancestors but after that point you know his co- you color of pomegranates and beyond surround fortress and so on his camera really rarely moved mm. I think there's a visual similarity between um Abeladze and and Parajanov's later cinema so Saram fortress and Ashab Karib they but actually, the cinematography cinematic. of Wishing Tree is quite similar to Shadows of Art. There's like a lot of a lot more mm. movement. Yeah, um, like, yeah. The camera is a lot more dynamic, and uh, it's about a community as well. Mm. Like thematically, it's it's similar. But yeah, some of the color um, the color schemes are more reminiscent of Surami Fortress and Ashik Karib. Yeah, because it's got that kind of like VHSy blowy blowout kind of like overly contrasty color color palette right like the reds are really mm. fucking red um and the greens are very green and um yes yeah, so it has this kind of this tv sloppiness to it almost like you're watching it on a like crt box set or something silence yeah <laughs> i mean I, I i repentance i think felt quite tv-ish in in and qu- quite sort of like i mean repentance reminded me more of um Blue Mountain or the Unbelievable Story by uh, Shangalaya Eldar mm. Shang- Eldar yeah, Shangalaya yeah. not his brother the Paris Mali guy um, yeah. another Georgian filmmaker and that, that's a sort of sort of slightly Kafkaesque absurdist satire not really Kafkaesque but you know, an absurdist satire about bureaucracy and 
And it's like, more Bulgakovian. Yeah, Bulgakovian, exactly. Like, and, under, yeah, absolutely. It's like he would have made a great uh, filmmaker of like uh, Master Magria, mm, put it that way. Exactly. Um, and I guess that's in a particular tradition of um, of Soviet bloc cinema that yeah, um, this- manages to kind of na- you know use a bit of a bit of satire and absurdism to kind of speak about the regime i don't find that stuff particularly i find it sort of charming um mm. and funny but it doesn't it doesn't really excite me well, i think once you've seen one of those films you've sort of seen them all so repent i i haven't watched all of repent so i've just seen the first 40 minutes but um but i mm. did i was sort of it's just yeah this stuff about how you know the the, the mayor has died and the, the, his wife wants to dig him back up again and he's been dug up several times and you know that, yeah. I mean it's sort of good it's a great it's a great conceit it's a great um, conceit for a film or maybe a book you know the the, the story here being that there's a, a, a mayor of a town who, who dies at the very beginning mm. to outpourings of grief you know he was a wonderful man he was a saint he was incredible you know he, he was our father um, his after this very opulent funeral um, his body keeps appearing in his son's lawn dug up standing against a tree or kind of sitting in a chair his kind of hand in his head and it's a really great concept um one of the frustrating things about repentance is you know abalatha has to solve the mystery so there is someone who's digging him up which for me is like disappointment because you're almost (laughs) like i almost don't want to know Mm. i I almost don't want it to be resolved The, the the chaos ensuing from someone being dug up and no one knowing how it's happening, whether it's supernatural or um, real, was more interesting to me. So it kind of, yeah, it kind of does, it kind of like shoots this load a bit too early by kind of there being an identifiable character. Mm. Um, uh, but that's where the drama of the film comes out because it's the wife of, a, of an artist who was um, uh, abducted um, and killed years ago. It's implied that this is like after communism. Um, mm even though it was uh, quite a few years before, you know, six, seven years before um, the Soviet Union collapsed, it's implied that, that this is all in the past because um, we see it's, we're, there are flashbacks. We see the court, mm. court proceedings and we look back to the life of the the, the clearly sort of Hitler slash uh, Stalin figure um, who is the mayor. Mm. Um what do you think about him? Because he's, yeah, he's, he, I don't know if the, the, the Hitler moustache that he's got is kind of a red herring for the censors. Like, oh no, this is really a film about Hitler, don't worry. Um, yeah, it's funny how you think? a moustache can be used in that way. Um, I just, mm. I don't know. I haven't seen enough of Repentance to really comment on it, like, with Watch Authority. I guess I want to ask you, like, are, like, are we, like, are, are you interested in discussing these, these films, like, for, in terms of their content? Or, or or is this a, is this a formal thing? Because I think that like the wishing tree is like very exciting to me formally. Yeah. And I and I I guess what like what grips me is the um is the style, the composition, the editing, which just mm. seems to have like a a freshness and an excitement to it. Um, the story it's it's just like a kind of it's from a completely different culture from from my culture and. I suppose I mean I mean, I don't know if this is true. I think sometimes when that when a film is like you know from a foreign culture, often like there has to be something formal going on for you to really be excited about it because the content they're just aspects true, it's, of the content. It's alien. Yeah, and I I guess like because a lot of the ideas in the narrative are about sort of nobility and stuff. And about and you know this woman is being having mud thrown at her at the end because you know she's gone away from this the the, the village tradition of who you should wishing tree yeah he's talking about here yeah yeah wishing tree yeah uh, who you should be married off to you know uh, no you're right I, I, it is good to talk about for, for, formal questions here um, because they are you're right wishing repentance isn't that formally interesting no in a bigger sense it's all all about I think it's why it's the popular Abelard's a film to talk about because it's like I was saying in the intro, it's very easy to kind of attach this this um pin, this anti stylist message to it. And it is about tyrants and about oppression. It joins that pantheon that, of like subversive satire yeah, films in the Soviet Union. Yeah. 
it makes people very comfortable because they go, oh, okay, fuck, this is understandable, comprehensible to me now because it's saying Stalin bad. I don't think the film is really doing that. I think it's a lot more about generational trauma. And if when you see the full whole film, if you will, that becomes really apparent. It's about the sins being passed down from father to son to his son. But about the complexity, the gray, you know, like um, Primo Levi's, like the gr- the grayness of, of trauma, of historical um, violence. Um, you know, it's not necessarily good versus evil. There's co-option and, and complicity and, and all these things. And I think the film is much better exploring that. And like you said, nobility, the nobility of the artist who, who kind of sacrifices himself or, well, not sacrifices himself, but stands up uh, for the sake of art and beauty and is killed. Um, but yeah, so that, that's, you, you, I think more of that will come through if you see the end of it. Um, but yeah, it's content wise, it's more interesting. The, the actual, formally, the story is a bit kind of sloppy slapdash the way it's shot. Mm. Um, there's some really beautiful moments. There's a really derivative Tarkovsky scene where you've got this girl with this um, shawl over her head and her mother, and they're kind of looking very plaintive while running around this. Um, this this kind of industrial site with loads of logs everywhere and it's pure it's pure stalker <laughs> um, in a slightly <laughs> derivative way um, but he must have just seen stalker it's filmed it a couple of years after so he's probably like fuck let's do something like that um, but yeah tell me tell me about the freshness in um, wishing tree and the things that excited you because um, I I love that a lot more mm. um, as a film it's mostly formal stuff amazing close ups of nature a kind of I guess you you just watch the the grass and the and the trees kind of blowing a bit and you yeah you just end up paying attention to these aspects of nature that you wouldn't wouldn't necessarily be immediately drawn to um and yeah these just the details and the and the cuts as well you know the way it cuts from like kind of a, a grass <coughs> grassy rural scene to like people's hands in the mud um mm. Yeah, it's a film that's kind of concerned with texture. I just, I'm not very good at following plot, as I've said before on this <laughs> podcast. And I, so I often, I'm often a way of framing a question uh, when I've been a bit inattentive is like, is it, mm. Im- is it important? Is it, you know, am I the only one who has sort of lost track of this? Is there something more interesting going on formally? Because it is a huge joy to watch this film, but. Yeah. But it's quite boring. Like, I don't feel particularly moved by the events of the film. No, because event wise, it's a story as old as time. You know, it's a, it's a folk story, effectively, a, 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 you know, repeated thousands of times across cultures over the world. You know, a young girl is in love with a young boy, but the elders of the village decide she should marry. Uh, you know, she should marry a man that's chosen for her. Mm-hmm. He belongs to a wealthy family and it would be good for the community. Um, she is unhappy in that marriage. The young boy goes to her when the, the husband is away, um, kind of tending his sheep or whatever. Uh, he, she, she is seen by an old crone who kind of dobs her in and then she's basically ritually sacrificed, killed by the community um, for contravening these laws. You know, she's a slut, she's a whore. Um even though she was, you know, her, her her death is tragic, and that's repeated thousands of times. That's everywhere. It's it's kind of in Parajanov. There's elements of this pastoral tragedy, and no, I wouldn't. Say, I was going to say that about Pelechian, like the other big Georgian filmmaker, but Pelechian is much Art more interested in the Pelechian. pastoral. Yeah, he's much more interested in the pastoral, but they all share they all share an obsession with the pastoral and with village life and, and simple Christianity and things like that. Um, but yeah, that that's kind of it it's the story is much of a muchness it's not really that important and what um, role does it have in society at that moment is it like defending the pastoral in the face of a sort of industrially dominated ideology it's definitely there right because the sub the subplot in the wishing tree is that there's a character this like mad uncle or he's he's probably the sanest person in it um who this kind of village idiot um, oh yeah when he's telling everyone the story and then he doesn't realize they've all fucked off <laughs> yeah he's a great um he's a great um uh, barometer for the audience actually there um, <laughs> and he like yeah he, he's 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 obsessed with this train that's going to come to the village um, and it's going to bring with it modernity and all, you know, normal modern stuff um, and the elders of the village are like you and your train blah 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 there, there's a clash of generations going on a bit isn't there as well um because it's time, it's timeless. I don't mean that in like a, the story, but like I can't place when this is supposed to be set. 
the train um, you know it says 20th century but it's kind of irrelevant as well right mm. um so yeah you 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 were really into the landscape then and the kind of poetry of of nature in this film yeah but i think i you know there are films that do that in a more ref, in a more like purposeful way you know like piavoli's mm. um uh, voices in time you know and uh, or hamon oh, rye even yeah. you know that we reviewed um, yeah, yeah, or, actually. or Brackage, you know, or Paraginov. I think those are films that sort of filmmakers who are more preoccupied by those formal aspects and therefore mm. that stuff comes to the fore. Uh, the, the story is almost a distraction here. I guess the story isn't quite strong enough and clear enough no. to be compelling. And then the visuals are... It's just, you know, it's kind of the worst thing you can say about film that it's well shot, right? You know, because it means you haven't <laughs> been able to absorb anything else. Um, um, yeah, and it is well shot in a way, but also not. That's the thing about that kind of sloppiness of his zooms and his framing. Yeah, There's, but that's all uh, good, right? I mean... Yeah, the way he does it is good, yeah. Like, it's you, things can be sloppy and still profound, you know. Oh, for sure. Um, for sure they can be. I mean... Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, you're right. The story does kind of fall away. Like you don't necessarily feel the tragedy, but there's some great, you know, sections. She has he. She's bought some slippers by her, the the man she loves, the boy she loves, and the slippers are kind of tossed into the air, um, and they they don't land. And there's these great moments of uh, I don't know. Again, kind of magic or the sublime, and where it kind of creeps in. Um, the death of a horse at the beginning. Like oh, the horse boy. bit is amazing. Yeah, so yeah, good. that first, was very beautiful. Um, One of my favourite horse bits in a film. Andre Rublev, really another horse, favourite horse bit. Great horse bit in Andre Rublev. Horse rolling around on its back in, in sort of slow motion. Oof. Oof. Just makes you want to fuck a horse. It, it, I, I really am. <laughs> um, it's weird you mentioned Andrew Rublev. I watched. Uh, sorry to digress a bit. Um, but I watched the, you know, the, I bought the Blu-ray recently. Oh, yeah. I was, fu- I was fucking with the um, disc two extras. Oh, right? yeah. oh God. A bit weird, aren't they? Criterion extras. Was you that Criterion good... Blu-ray of Andrew Rublev? Uh, no, so it wasn't. It was... Um, Artificial Eye. Artificial Eye, sorry. Oh, the extras um, are really bad on that, right? It's, the, they're, they're it's really, like a psychoanalyst really trying, to, trying to tell you about Tarkovsky. Awful. Yeah, yeah, it's like a two-part eps- essay, but... It, why it's in two parts is unclear because they're about seven minutes each um, and it's like and, Andre Rublev the, the psychoanalytic eye or something and then Ugh. it's this kind of really stiff kind of almost computer woman's computer voice um, kind of reading this really dry like a, if you were for a second year at uni and you'd been asked to write like an essay about psychoanalysis and Tarkovsky or something and it, it read like that all this so, really basic so shit so middle class isn't it Really riddle class, actually. And uh, like, why else about... would you kind of mix Tarkovsky it's, with? It's just because people who watch Tarkovsky like to go to, to analysis. They go, mm, yes, I read the biography of Freud uh, that was recommended. It's like it's got nothing to do with Tarkovsky, yeah. actually. You know? No, nothing. It's all about God, spiritualism. Yeah. About. Um, I, I think Abelazza is. Yeah, he, he he reaches a sublimer thing, and yeah, the, the the plot can actually distract you. Maybe there's too much plot in it. Um, I yeah, love right, the, the bit. The moment, well, now go on. I love the bit where he go, he comes. The man, I don't even know who fucking anyone is, but a really hot woman <laughs> called Gedja. The she she the woman the, with the big juicy naturals. No, not her. Um, oh. a brunette. And you are like Gedja. You come to me. You're alive. Um, I'm just replaying it. Um, and and she hugs him and she's very happy. Uh, and and she says, "Did you come to me?" Perhaps I'm dreaming you, Gedja, and you know, they're just smiling and laughing. And That's then, beautiful. And then he hugs her and he says, I couldn't not come. And then I'd rather die than live like that. Something's happening to me. They're just in this kind of state. And then and then yeah, then she just like lets go of him and cries. I hear nothing, neither the what what did she say? Are you talking about their um their their tryst in the house? I hear nothing, neither the birds singing nor the leaves rustling. Ugh. There's a real, there's a real poetry, there's a real poetry to him. I, I think, 
Yeah, moments with the horse, the slipper being thrown in the air. There's a great scene where the, the madman of the village, um, Ralph's Ralph, Ralph hit play. Um, there's a great scene yeah. where he kind of storms across the field where they're working and mm. uh, kind of trashes the fences up. And no one, no, nobody interferes because the fence is in his way. Um, and it's just him struggling with this fence and tearing out of the earth. Um, and he's not really saying anything. And there's these great moments where it doesn't try to add plot. It just shows how people are feeling. It's really powerful. There's, you know, yeah. This bit, he kind of this bit where she's letting go of him. She's like, she was before. She was like euphoric to see him, and then you have this wide shot of a woman listening in on their conversation from outside. Yeah, and there's the a old crow. Maybe. Yeah, there's a thunder outside, and then she walks away, and she just says, "Go away." She turns her back on him and says, "Go away," and starts crying. It's really amazing that sort of depiction of ambivalence there. She and she rush, mm. her body rushes towards the corner of the of this this little this little house. Yeah, and he's just it's looking really, really great. mournful. Yeah, the the ambivalence, knowing that their their love was, is doomed or, or destructive. I think there's also a character in it who is a again a kind of mystic in a way, and he's looking for the wishing tree. This you know there's actually a wishing tree, and he um he dies in the film. Mm. Um, and freezes. He freezes to death. Oh, oh, sitting oh, up. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> let Pretty me, much. let me freeze again. <laughs> this is what we get now. Um, sing along time with Moochie. So it's but just become freezes. like a very highbrow come down. <laughs> it really has. That's where I'm at at the moment, to be honest. We both had quite an intense day. Um, but the father in the shroud, he leaves his children and he goes and they live in this kind of rick, 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 uh, rickety house and he goes to search for the wishing tree and he, he freezes to death out in the woods, um, mm -hmm. searching for it. Uh, and he's kind of assembled this bit of stained glass and a twig, whatever. He's using it as this, this seeing eye to kind of view things. So there's all, there's all this kind of searching for meaning um, and, and kind of, I guess, cruelty, actually. It's really good how it shifts to register. Again, you know, these quite serious avant-garde composition and framing on these shots, and you get these really silly bits. There's, a, there's a, this, like, big fat retard lad basically chases a priest, mm -hmm. which is, in some <laughs> sense, is a really bad scene, <laughs> you know? It's just this big retard just running, and it's almost like Benny Hill. <laughs> and it's moments where Abelatha can't quite help himself from, like, um, turning into kind of a comedy of manners. Um, so well, he, it is yeah, a comedy way, of manners. The whole thing is a comedy yeah, of manners. That's, that's what irritates me a bit about it. Is it's kind of like it is sort of like a bit slapstick. A lot of it. Yeah, slapstick is definitely right. And I just think that um, sort of ruins that ruins some of the romance for me. Maybe I'm a bit sort of purist. Um, no, maybe I think it, it just it, makes it, it a bit it, twee. I think. It makes it a tweet. It disables the film from sustaining the highs. It doesn't like Abelardo doesn't trust the highs enough of like the mm. the la the ambivalence of love, the death of the horse. If the whole film was like the death of the horse. We'd be looking at a, 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 a you know rock solid masterpiece here um, that people talk about and go, oh, the wishing tree. Um, yeah, but I, obviously I don't want things to be sort of like tokenistically art house serious, you know. No, no. But I guess it you feels do, you do a bit. I do a bit, yeah. little bit, I little see, bit, just a little bit. bit. <laughs> <laughs> like it's I think weird. humor, it like in change. Tarkovsky, humor comes up in this kind of, in a more sort of cold, absurdist way, like the phone going off in Stalker mm. and stuff. Yeah, or the kid who um, Andrew Rublev, you know, who kind of it's a, it's a tragic scene, the scene of like Andrew Rublev regaining his faith, but mm. the kid kind of acknowledging that he doesn't know how to. Um, oh, the, make the a bell, bell thing was all kind of fake news. Or bullshit, and it's kind of funny in a way. You know, mm. it's kind of done in this this humorous way, and it's again, you say so you're right. It's like cold. But that's ironic like humor high stakes is. humor, you know. That's not just some it's guy totally, falling over, yeah. you know, over his dick uh, with his sheep or something. You know, I don't know. Because there's like a lascivious priest in this, isn't there? There's like a priest. Who's oh yeah, just he's trying to bang with the, the woman, big with, woman. The, with the breasts. And it is done in this yeah comedy of errors. And there's kind this of like, sort of clown woman dressed up with the with the kind of parasol. Weird. I didn't like. That whole narrative was woman. crap. Really crap. That re that reminded me of the work, the, the things I liked the least about the Hourglass Sanatorium, actually. Yeah, should we talk about Hourglass Sanatorium? Because we we podcasted on it mm. uh, a few months ago, and um, a while ago. 
There's similarities right here, in the same way that there's similarities with like on the Silver Globe, and there's similarities with all these different. I mean, on the Silver Globe is like working. an extraordinarily, like, <coughs> excuse insane me, like film, the highs sorry. and lows of that film are, uh, have such disparity. At, on the Silver mm -hmm. Globe by Andrzej Zdrowski, it's like a sci-fi film that he failed to complete during, like until yeah. the, until much later. Well, he kind of felt, yeah, he just filled in the gaps because the production With was cut. Supermarket oh, footage and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it's kind of an avant garde masterpiece by accident. It also has loads of bits that just ugh, kind of just suck. But like yeah, other bits, quite a lot. other bits that um, are just like absolute banger. Mm -hmm. You can kind of fast forward through the second hour, I would say. Of, of oh, yeah. Like, the first hour it has a lot is of, um, profound. Yeah, the first hour is profound. The, the before. The, the conflict is where it ensues when it's just the the early telling of this mm. this planet um it's got a lot of annoying cinematography as well um i remember like whoa this bit's a fish eye lens but there's or, not really ooh, any humor in on the silver globe i guess but our glass no. sanatorium is is quite twee and and full of like surrealist humor and absurdism and i think what i well, when i was a teenager i really loved our glass sanatorium because yeah it kind of showed you it showed you that surrealism could be um yeah this is filmed by Vojek has 1973 um and it showed you that like a dream a, a narrative a sort of narrative could be both m like non-linear and moving and there could be things that are sort of impervious to reason mm. um and yeah as a sort of someone sort of raised in a kind of r realist english um, palette. I was like really inspired by this wacky Polish shit. Um, yeah. And yeah. Um, and I've sort of I, people have been trying to disavow me of this film now recently, saying that it's just Polish Terry Gilliam, which I, that's it, which that's unfair. Yeah, which is funny because some um, people like Terry Gilliam and so that's not a bad thing. But for me, I think maybe I I I I, I want to differentiate them because. I just think Aglas sometimes is much more intelligent and has a well, more interesting historical Gilliam grounding. Gilliam is just weird for the sake of weirds. Mm, his, yeah. his surrealism is actually a lot more pure than, um, you know, Gilliam is pushing uh, uh, taste. His surrealism pushes boundaries of taste mm. and uh, kind of uh, narrative logic. Um, and it is, it's a surrealism through exaggeration. Mm. Um, whereas Haas is much more yeah grounded in a political and social context which doesn't necessarily make it better but it's also sub reaching towards the sublime and it's really concerned with mourn you call it like a mournful um atmosphere it has you know it's more concerned with dreams and, and the fallibility of memory and fading and all these kind of mm. quite sad mournful keys that it strikes which gilliam could never you, you know even mm. when gilliam is sad like Brazil is quite a, a, a you know, a depressing film, but it, it never stops being like, whoa, this is w wacky time. It's wacky, mm. wacky. You know, it's just like that. Whereas has has like the the, the mournful note that you know, at the death march, mm. which inhibits inhabits it. And maybe yeah, Abelardo does, but it comes as a real shock. In he kind of smash cuts to that logic, mm. like um, wishing tree. At the end, when it turns out the girl is is is, is killed and she's hounded out the village and stoned to death, pretty much, and then mm. just dies, um, and everything's suddenly really misty and sad, and it's raining and it's all very bleak. Uh, and in 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 um, uh, repentance, it kind of has that uh, towards the end when the reckoning comes. Um, it kind of switches register with all these amazing. Actually, it gets really good at the end. I think I think you should stick persevere to the to the closing half an hour or so um we the son of the the mayor the dictator kind of confronts his own complicity and continuing this logic and and trans transferring this generational trauma to his own son um and there's some really powerful dream sequences um towards the end of that which mm. are really great actually okay. um yeah but it has a bit of a saggy middle <laughs> um i mean for a two yeah. and a half hour film it's it's not unusual um, the ending yeah. of Wishing Tree is kind of amazing because it's incredibly dark and muddy and mournful and then it cuts to this sort of video essay on on like how beautiful the world is <laughs> and yeah. it's just like these close ups of flowers <laughs> <Is it>? and stuff <laughs> yeah and it's um, just the like house the, the crumbling house with the pomegranate tree 
yeah as, exactly uh, George and seem upset I can't fucking make a film without mentioning a pomegranate um, yeah apparently Jesus um, have you seen Pelletian do you remember much Pelletian yeah I mean Pelletian has an amazing editing style I feel like maybe mm, much more indebted to we'd have more style, yeah right? we'd have more to say about Pelletian formally because he is he is like he is it for, and Pelletian is interesting because of like we, like we're well okay I you, you do have a, a, sto- a specific historical interest in like Soviet bloc countries yep um yep. I don't really, I am, I'm here for like formal innovation. And so Palatian is more, more stimulating to me because he's doing something like really odd and, and interesting and novel mm. with editing that I haven't quite, I haven't yeah. had time to really focus on, in on, but I've seen a few of his films and, yeah. and like, I want to know, I want to know more about where that style goes, you know? Um, yeah. He, he does this thing. Well, I don't know what the word is for it, but he kind of cuts between things in this really odd rhythm yeah he's got a well it's kind of, he I, I kind of said like Eisenstein Verto I don't think that's necessarily true because he's he's much more put off in Dojenko um I think um and he's got this more interpretive is that the right word maybe impressionistic editing style I think I've really liked it when I've watched him because his, his films have they're all at that elevated pitch even if they're just about um Montage Nature. at a distance, it's called. Montage at distance, okay. Uh, it seems to be it's a theory which seeks to recognise the ways in which every element of a film, every frame or shot or cut relates to every other element, a relation which can be it's managed like match, and, match and controlled and, and sustained and, and or troubled through repetition and the creation of distance. So two key shots which carry important semantic charges, bearing shots in Palatian's lexicon, will be separated mm. by the insertion of a bunch of other shots. The introduction of a number of interactions and links between them, which develops arguably a deeper and more significant expression of meaning that would then would have been achieved from placing the two bearing shots next to one another. So it's almost yeah. ma- ma- mathematical. Rather than yeah. seeing that Fetelman's film as a chain of signification, Palacian understands it as a spiral or a rotating spherical consfi- configuration of meanings in contexts wow. which influence each other. Um, the one the, to watch the, is Seasons of the Year. That's the... Um, we as well is really interesting. Um, yeah, uh, there's a good quote from him here. Actually, say uh, he says this is him, him himself, and he's like, uh, "It's not." Uh, ba 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 He says Eisenstein's montage was linear, like a chain. Distance montage creates a magnetic field around the film. Um, sometimes I don't call my method montage. I'm involved in a process of creating unity. In a sense, I've eliminated montage by creating the film through montage. I've destroyed montage. Wow, that's such a the tautology but whatever um, <laughs> so he's creating a wholeness whereas yeah Eisenstein's revolution in film was to use montage to create internal momentum in the plot to mm. get you from A to B yeah. to C to D in a really exciting interesting way that's it Palatian sort um, of gets you closer to what he's showing you through montage it transcends yeah. the shot choice through it the essentials yeah he's, he's really interesting I mean this really should have been a Palatian um, the, the quote by the way that I read out was from uh, Andrew Key aka Roland Barthes um, film oh, was it? yeah represent um, from a few months ago a few months ago yeah I remember him mentioning um, Palatian a while back maybe that's what I was thinking of him um, there's a, it's weird to me because Georgian film I've only seen Palatian Palajanov who and uh, <laughs> Fucking hell, Abeladze. And so Shangalaya, have you seen they Eldar Shangalaya or the other Shangalaya? Uh, no, I've seen bits. I mean, it's quite quite similar to Repentance. It's just a sort of social satire. It's mm. about bureaucracy. It's about this guy at a publishing house who's um, he's trying to get his colleagues to read his book called Blue Mountain or The Unbelievable Story. And they all kind yeah. of say they'll read it. Some of them say they have read it, read it but none of them can really provide That's any great. evidence that they have actually read it. And it's just this constant... Um, oh, that's so process. good. That just sounds... You sold me on that straight yeah, away. Yeah, yeah. You would love it. I this find is, it a bit boring, but, yeah. you know, it's 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 a classic <laughs> social satire on, like, <laughs> on like you know, in, inefficient communist life. Um, this mm, film, We, mm. by Pelletian, is fucking amazing. It's got, like, a sort of yeah, Soy Cuba energy. Army, yeah, it's about the country. It's about it's about national history. Um, Damn, uh, we should do something like that media. for England, you know, for um, good old Albion. I, I feel really bad. So I was talking about Georgian film. Pelechin obviously is an Armenian film director. Um, yeah, pretty bad if you. Uh, I've, I've I've seen him. Uh, Guess he did an imperialism there. 
did an imperialism. I did a I did a no growth. <laughs> um, he's another uh, VGIK grad. Um, so what's the deal with VGIK? Right, it was like this kind of good film school that they all went to. Yeah, Moscow Garasimov Institute of Cinematography. Yeah, um, but yeah, I. It's kind of weird. It's, I've seen him referred to in a kind of Maya Diren way, and there's a kind of yeah, the the if you take Meshes of the Afternoon or whatever, a film which kind of has, has these kind of this spiraling mixture of shots and match shots and match cuts. Even even actually um, watching Don't Look Now, watching Rogue the other day. And that's that's much more played out and done in a much slower, more m- more methodical way, um, to less beautiful effect probably. But there's a similarity there as well. I think with yeah using these, and it can seem quite um, heavy-handed actually. But I think it's something film is really good at. And there's a kind of fear about using, you know, you kind of turn your nose up about symbols. Oh, that's just a symbol. But it, I think it's quite powerful. Like don't don't look now is very powerful because it infuses like little things like color and shape. Yeah, with. blimey, I'm so ambivalent about symbols because yeah. my big yeah. thing is that Bresson. I, I love. I think Bresson is sort of pure cinema because he doesn't engage in symbols. No, but then I well, watched the this. I watched this amazing him, new and uh, not new, but like relatively unseen Bresson film called Une Femme Douce, yeah. a Gentlewoman. You really rated that, didn't you? Yeah, I think it's one of my favorite films ever. Wow. Okay. Yeah, but it is has it has actually unusually for Bresson it is actually like got lots of some meta- physical metaphors in it. Look. I think when you're when you're when you're being smart with them, I mean Nicholas Rogue. It's interesting. It has this momentum, but they are a bit cringe. It's like oh the red, you know. Oh, I find it cringe. Red. I find Nick Rogue yeah. cringe. I'm gonna say that. Yeah. I mean I, there are, there are ones by him I haven't seen that I'd like to like bad timing and stuff, but. Mm. Um, Man who fell to earth and don't look now. Just they just feel a bit cr- a bit like yeah. a bit cringe. Um, a bit performance cringe. is kind of good, but like only because mm. of the weirdness of it. I just sort of wouldn't really, mm. you know, like yeah. It's yeah. I, I I mean yeah. I don't know. They 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 can be cringe. Symbols can be cringe. I think when but when there's a logic to their and it's linked to shot choice and it's linked to kind of yeah this this spiraling whirlpool of shots that someone like. Palacian is creating I think it kind of transcends the symbol isn't just the mirror the red coat you know which is very you know fucking Spielberg in, in um, the sad holocaust film I can't remember the name of um, Saving Private Red Coat that has um, the girl with the red coat and it's just such a cringe symbol and it kind of Schindler's List do you mean? Schindler's List yeah Saving Private Schindler it, it makes Saving the, Ryan's Privates Shaving Ryan's Private. Um, actually a remarkable film, um, Saving Private Ryan, in some ways. Um, but yeah, that's for another day. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't it think it like is for another day. I can't really imagine no. the other day when we'll be talking about Saving Private Ryan. Next, tune in next time when we're doing the back catalogue. Yeah, I think we've kind of drifted on Spalacian. We've drifted away from... Drifted onto a lot of things. A lot of things. I don't know if that reflects our state of mind. I think it's hard to talk about Abelasse. Um There's a lot to like. I really, I really love him. I think The Wishing Tree is spectacular. Mm-hmm. Um, um, formally invigorating. Uh, let down by some tweeness and some some bizarre plot subplots that kind of you know that we were watching um the where's the friend's house mm. by kirstami kirstami has a tightness and a, and a um a continuity throughout it um yeah it and maintains he's such a formalist tenor, as well such a formalist whereas yeah it's this is almost like the wishing tree is almost like an inferior version of where's the friend's house um and it could, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't sustain that, that tension and that, that power. You know, at the end of Where's the Friend's House and the door clatters open mm. in the storm and he looks outside and there's the mother kind of trying to bring in the washing and it's just, it, there's no words. It's just the, the whole mm. scene is wrapped with um, its significance and the sublime. Um, Abelazza doesn't really achieve that. He's, he's a bit too excitable. As, you know, when you watch Repentance, says characters bursting in someone's singing opera uh, there's knights walking around tapping on the window and the camera zooms in at them and then there's a r- suddenly a really Tarkovsky and sad scene it, it it's very erratic I love it I really love it but yeah it's very erratic and I can see why you're like uh, I don't know a bit ambivalent about 
him and why you wouldn't put him up there in the in the you know in the in the rafters in the holy rafters and the canon the pantheon the canon pantheon he might be more interesting than no he's not more interesting than Pajanov. um no paraj paraj just has a very distinctive Paj. aesthetic mm. i think it's just quite is like all aesthetic no it's yeah not it's unfair. it's no but um, it's just he commits to the bit i think and it doesn't really <laughs> respect it doesn't really yeah. fucking matter like what mm. what's going on in Parajanov. I you're just sort of no no it doesn't there's enough like aesthetic consistency in Parajanov that it is just a, a an absolute romp even his later work that's kind of a bit mm. a bit, bit shonky a bit shonky like you're just like there's like loads of just sort of really constructed images mm. um whereas yeah, like the wishing tree gets a bit carried away by telling a story, and then repentance seems, from what I've seen of it, to um, to just be like a straightforward like story, mm. like a sort of satire film, yeah. which kind of just doesn't interest me as much. No, it um, does. It does transcend that towards the end. I recommend watching the the okay. the, the, the um. I'll watch the final really half hour. Watch the final half hour. The the I'm not going to watch the saggy middle. Don't watch the saggy middle. It's really not helpful. Um. <laughs> it's a bit self serious. The 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 end when basically the characters are in the courtroom are visited by dreams. Um, oh, I'm uh, down for that. It's really interesting where the son is trapped in this concrete circle with the grandfather, the dead grandfather, um, who's kind of seeking forgiveness. Then the father has a dream um, where he sees his father like eating his fish. In this very dark room and he's holding a candle up and it's this very it's imbued with all this symbolism and then the father's kind of revealed as this devil-like character and the, he snaps out of his dream he's holding the bones of this fish in his hand there's some really shocking powerful bits and the editing is much tighter it's just yeah he's it's weird with like Abadaz because he yeah it's almost like a kid in a candy shop um approach to filmmaking um yeah. but he's not disciplined enough to really like is there more to say about, about, about I don't know what have you got to say what have you got to say for yourself <laughs> what I've got to say about myself <laughs> is that I am you wanted to ultimately ill equipped for this episode mm. because I watched The Wishing Tree in quite a distracted state and I watched some mm. of Repentance in an even more distracted state while I should have been working yeah and I there's sometimes a bit of a chicken and egg thing with this mm film and watching stuff where like you become less interested in something the less attention you give it i think that's slightly yeah. happened to me full transparency yeah. Um, um yeah but i, I think also i was i'm just a bit burnt out we've d we've done some amazing pods recently yeah and i feel and we were going to do the um the extra the one year extravaganza because because of the way the anniversary lands it could either have been this week or next week and i having done a bunch of yeah. guest shows in a row um well not even guest shows in a row but just like really important a lot of really important amazing yeah. shows recently yeah um i just kind of well after you've done i froze like i was my, just like i can't do yeah. the big pod this week so we did a last no, minute we, small pod and i uh, yeah it's weird because we we've done altman we've done snow we've done big filmmakers in their own ways and we really immersed ourselves into mm. their worlds i think I really like Abladze in a kind of distant way, I suppose. I'm realising in this conversation that I'm more interested in Pelesia. Um, FYI. Yeah. But yeah, it's weird. It's film, film has been such a kind of a, a rock during um, lockdown, right? Yeah. We've watched between us a lot of film um, collectively and alone. Um, and... I, I don't even want to count I don't have like a letterbox or anything I can't even begin to count um, you know yeah I mean we've point, definitely been watch watching like three or four films a week for sure both of us um, um, and some weeks some films. weeks just kind of like munching through them like as soon mm. as one's finished just slap on another one yeah I think sometimes I think not that I need to take a break from film but I think I need to make something <laughs> Yeah, no, too. I, me too. Yeah. I think it's time to make. You know? I think Sounds it is time to make. I think we've had various moments on this podcast where we've sort of thought 
thought, well, we are makers and we don't want to get mm. too caught up in this process of constantly talking about other people's films. Yeah. Um, and I don't know when that moment happens. We've got some exciting episodes coming up. We're going to do Dusan really Makayevich with Igor. We're going to do yes, Bruno Dumont yes. with George Macbeth. We're going to do um, we're going to do a big extravaganza next week. We've got Godard the WhatsApp four group. as well with Daniel Nefitu. Oh, Godard number four, yeah, with with yeah, Daniel Nefitu. We're going to look at Image Book and Film Socialisme. Exactly. Um, yeah, which is going to be paying. So this is our lull. You can tell from our. Um, yeah, I'm slightly tired. Um, talking, whispering like this. We're doing ASMR now. Get that wake up. Jesus Christ. Um, yeah, Jesus Christ. I am. Um, uh, yeah, we, we, we are in mourning for our own eyes. I watched five films the other weekend. Like one night, sorry, one day. Wow. I watched five films. It was a lot. And it's like, I don't think the human Mad. brain. What were the five films? Can you remember? Fuck, it was like. It was a real roller coaster, you know. It went from it was something very. It might have started with the wishing tree, like a, my s- second watch of the wishing tree, mm-hmm. and then I went from there, and I, I ended up the final film. I ended up. Bear in mind, I was I was, I was really pissed by this point because I bought a lot of beers, and I thought I'm just going to sit here drinking beer until I pass out. Um, wow! As a way to pass the time, um, and I ended up watching Zero Dark Thirty. Um, <laughs> was this the day eyes. that you watched The Shining as well? I watched The Shining. That was somewhere in the middle of those five films. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, some Shining Peel Out and like, yeah. Yeah, I might have watched some Peel Out in the midst of that. Yeah, I Peel Out in the midst of that. I, I, yeah, I finished on Zero Dark Thirty by Catherine Bigelow. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, bless Bloody you. Bloody hell. Um, Zero Dark Thirty. Fucking, uh, it's, it's just like whitewashing uh, torture. I feel really bad for torturing these Muslims, um, but we got him the end they uh um, they don't jessica, pus- they pus- jessica justain the plant the the ginger girl <laughs> yeah she's really fit see i thought i was talking did I was, you hear, um, hear what i called her no i didn't it, it fucked Je- 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 jessica justain <laughs> jessica justain justain maxwell <laughs> um, it's there a really funny film there's in the sense somewhere that somewhere in the world there's like a kind of uh a, 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 a very serious face film studies professor who's been this looking all awesome. over for like a nuanced discussion <laughs> of Abu, of Tengiz Abulads and they, they're, they're scanning <laughs> Ab- Ab- they're Ab- going Ab- through <laughs> they're going through this whole episode just to make sure yeah. that, that you know there's some scholarship in here and yes, here we are peer-reviewed. calling 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 Jessica Chastain Jessica, Jessica Chastain, Chastain. <laughs> Um, not for any reason though. other than it. it's no funny. it's just funny to say it's funny words put together isn't it um the film is fine i was listening to someone else talk about series like they after this um and they said that the film almost makes because jessica just stains role in it she's like this new <laughs> new cia agent and they said her first job is to like go and waterboard people which seems unlikely but okay cheerful and she's like this awkward um She's like in every, every, it's like a millennial because she's got a bit of anxiety and she's a bit socially awkward. Um, I am a like, cisgender woman <laughs> with generalized oh, yeah, anxiety disorder. Anxiety disorder. <laughs> and I'm proud to work working. for the CIA. I'm a woman working for the CIA. Um, yeah, she but girl bosses them. She e-markets them. Um, she, she makes them shoppable. Um <laughs> But yeah, it's weird. It's a good. It's a good thriller towards the end. Actually, it's like actually, it's because Catherine Bigelow is good at what she does, mm-hmm. um, you know. But it's it's morally uh, deranged, a morally deranged film, and then pushes out because it won't show Bin Laden's face when they kill him. It's just a, a bloke where you see a bit of beard and a nose, but it's quite a big nose, and it's like, come on, Christ, show us, show us the money shot, show us the face. Um, um, on that note, yeah. Yeah. Thank you for listening, listeners. <laughs> if you're still with <laughs> us. <laughs> this is the I'm glad we every every podcast has to have like a like a failure episode. Hump week. Yeah, this week this yeah. is just bad, I think. This isn't no, this is, we we've had some good conversations about Abalazza and Pelesian. We read from an article about Pelesian. Yeah, the best uh, bit was when I read so, what someone it? else wrote. <laughs> This has been the worst episode we've ever done. No, it hasn't. <laughs> but that what, 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 was, me. what was the worst episode? Uh, 
Baccarat episode two. Oh, that's true. Yeah, obviously with the yeah. most podcasts, the first two episodes are the worst. No, actually the LA mixtape episode we did because we did it for. Oh, Discord. that was bad because <laughs> we, we wanted to. So films with black people. By the way, black yeah, people yeah. are in the news right now. We are uh, reviewing films that by was, black that people. That was such um, a fucking misstep on our part. But it was the third it really episode. Was. I also think young. our Marlon Kutsiev episode was a bit, a bit weak. I thought. Uh, no, I like that. Uh, oh yeah, it was, it was quite good. Uh, I don't know. It's I the last really time. It's the last time I remember not having yeah. something to say. Right, right. I think it's just because you've actually been living your life this this week, and I, I'm still a hermit. Yeah, you know? it's true. I've been on the sosh. You've been on the sosh. I was for uh, a few days, but it, it, it destroyed me. <laughs> and now I'm back, back, back to my bullshit at home. Um, oh, well, you'll be you'll be round for some search tomorrow night. So all, all's worth oh, yeah, as well. Yeah, we will. We can talk about that now. We're having a fully legal yeah, yeah. drinking session, boob tube drinking session. With a few former night. guests of the pod. Um, uh-huh. Uh-huh. Okay, let's farewell to the listeners. Yeah, you're, you're an absolute trooper Thanks. for getting this far, whoever you are. <laughs> if you got this far. Um, please tune in next week when this, will, this episode will be much better. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. <laughs>